Good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you. I trust you've had a good week. How many of you were here yesterday evening to hear Jim Buller in his first presentation? Okay, a good amount of us, praise the Lord. Um, this morning, we will continue to that end. Um, Jim Buller will be continuing, Jim Buller, excuse me, will be continuing with his uh, preparation for the end time program. It, of course, starts here at 9.30. We're doing things a little bit differently. Normally, we, we're split up, but because of a special speaker, special program, he'll be conducting our Sabbath school session today from 9.30 p.m. to roughly around 10.30 p.m. And then we'll take a 10-minute pause so everybody could uh, go out, drink some water, move around, go to the bathrooms. And then at 10.40, we'll start our main uh, worship service. And Jim Buller will also be uh, speaking for that as well. And then... We have potluck, uh, and everyone's invited for that, of course. So if you're a guest here, please stay after our main service and, and join us for potluck for a free meal. And then afterwards, from 2 to 4, we'll be having um, here on the church ground, actually, just in the back here, because we have a few acres here at the church. We'll be just doing, uh, Jim Buller will be conducting a walk, a plant demonstration, and then a talk afterwards on the lawn. So... Out in the foyer, when we break, make sure you, or if you have a bulletin, make sure you look up the insert inside, and it'll kind of give you the schedule for the rest of the day. We have a lot of stuff going on. We're going to be busy, busy, but praise the Lord. So with that, I'd like to invite Mr. Buller forward, and he will start our Sabbath school segment this morning. Thank you. Good morning. morning. Happy Sabbath. Beautiful day out there. Okay, let's turn to John. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, there is a study guide for the study this morning. Uh, how many of you have it? Anybody have it yet? Nobody has it yet. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, okay, they're going to get it. Good. We'll just take a minute with that. Uh, I go through the here last night. I said this, I was to say it again. Um, some people like the study guide, some don't. Uh, you're not being graded or anything by it, so, you know, if it works for you, fine. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. Uh, the main reason I have the study guide is I'm hoping you will share this information. And the study guide gives you an outline of the study so that you can do that more easily. I have one here. <laughs> Extra one. Oh, here she comes with them. Good. Okay. My wife Becky will be making out an answer key, so if you don't get all the blanks filled in, uh, you can check with her afterward. Real good, okay. Okay, turn to John chapter 14, verse 26. John chapter 14, verse 26.
And what's the promise there? What's the promise in John 14, verse 26? Okay, this is one of the promises that, the, that God would send the Holy Spirit. And what's the promise that he will do here? He'll teach you all teach things. us all things. How many of you want to be taught by the Holy Spirit this morning? Amen. And if you remember from last night, let's look at the first quotation. It's in the back of the study guide. There's a quotation sheet. It's from Review and Herald, March 22, 1887. If we want the Holy Spirit, there's a part that we have to play in that. says, there is nothing that Satan fears so much as that the people of God shall do what? Clear the way. And how do we clear the way? By removing every hindrance so the Lord can pour out his spirit upon a languishing church and an impenitent congregation. And then a little farther down the paragraph, it says, when the way is prepared for the spirit of God, the blessing will come. And so if we want the Holy Spirit to come and teach us, what do we need to do? To Clear the way, way uh-huh, by removing every hindrance. So hopefully you've already checked in with God this morning and the way is clear. But just in case you haven't, I would invite you to do so as we pray and claim this promise. Father, thank you so much that uh, you haven't left us to our own wisdom and our own understanding. Promise to send your Holy Spirit to teach us. And Lord, we claim that promise this morning. And along with claiming that promise, we recognize we have a part to do also, to clear the way. Make sure there's nothing standing between you and us. And so if there's anything that's standing between you and us, may we be willing to set it aside right now so that we can be taught by your Holy Spirit we can recognize your voice and be blessed by it I pray in Jesus name Amen I should warn you uh, the study we're doing this morning uh, both during Sabbath school and church time it's a longer study so we'll be kind of breaking in the middle uh, and do the rest of it at church uh, this is a study of studies. It's like almost any point that we make could be a whole study in itself. In some cases, it could be a whole series of studies in itself. Um, and so, <clears throat> with some especially talkative groups, this can take a long time because a lot of things come up. Um, but we're hoping to push through it here this morning. So I'm not saying don't ask questions, but uh, just kind of keep in mind that this is a study of studies and that any of these points could be a whole study in itself. I want to begin by looking at a dream that Ellen White had that's recorded in Testimonies to the Church, Volume 2, pages 594. Uh, that's where it starts anyway. It goes on for a couple of pages. Uh, we're just going to look at the first five paragraphs, uh, rather than, and that's this quotation number two. So I'd invite you to turn there, follow along. Uh, I used to kind of try to paraphrase this first part so you get the picture, but I found it's just as easy to read it. Uh, we're going to focus on the fifth paragraph, but you need to get the setting for what's happening there first. It says, while in Battle Creek in August of 1868, I dreamed of being with a large body of people. A portion of this assembly started out prepared to journey. We had heavily loaded wagons. As we journeyed, the road seemed to ascend. On one side of the, this road was a deep precipice. On the other, a high, smooth, white wall with a hard finish upon the, like the hard finish upon plastered rooms. As we journeyed on, the road grew narrower and steeper. Okay, that's key. 
This road grows narrower and steeper as they go on. In some places it seemed so very narrow that we concluded we could no longer travel with the loaded wagons. We then loosed them from the horses, took a portion of the luggage from the wagons, and placed it on the horses and journeyed on on horseback. As we progressed, the path still continued to grow narrow. We were obliged to press close to the wall to save ourselves from falling off the narrow road down the, deep, the steep precipice. As we did this, the luggage on the horses pressed against the wall and caused us to sway towards the precipice. We feared that we should fall and be dashed in pieces on the rocks. We then cut the luggage from the horses and it fell over the precipice. We continued on horseback greatly fearing as we came to the narrower places in the road that we should lose our balance and fall. At such times, a hand seemed to take the bridle and guide us over the perilous way. As the path grew more narrow, we decided we could no longer go with safety on horseback, and we left the horses and went on foot in single file, one following in the footsteps of another. At this point, small cords were let down from the top of the pure white wall. These were eagerly grasped to aid us in keeping our balance upon the path. As we traveled, the cord moved along with us. The, the path finally became so narrow, we concluded we could travel more safely without our shoes, so we slipped them from our feet and went on some distance without them. Soon it was decided we could travel more safely without our stockings, and these were removed and we journeyed on with bare feet. Okay, so you get the picture there? They're heading up this path that keeps growing narrower and steeper, and they're having to leave more and more stuff behind in order to keep going up the path. Okay, notice the fifth paragraph. We then thought of those who had not accustomed themselves to, hard, to privations and hardships. Where were such now? They were not in the company. At every change, some were left behind. And those only remained who had accustomed themselves to endure hardships. The privations of the way only made these more eager to press on to the end. You get the picture? That key phrase there is, at every change, some were left behind. So when they had to leave the wagons behind, there were some that stayed back. When they had to cut the light, well, luggage off of the horses, some stayed back. When they had to leave the horses behind, some stayed back. When they had to take off their shoes, there were those that stayed back. And when they took off their stockings, even that far along, there were still some that stayed back. I was thinking about this. And I felt the Holy Spirit impressing me. You know, like, Jim, what, do you, what is the goal for your ministry? And I want to ask you that question this morning. Okay, what is the goal of your ministry? Are we content to just get people started on the path? And I realized, uh-uh. <laughs> that's not my goal. My goal is to make sure they get all the way to the end. I hope that's yours too. And with those thoughts, let's look at the next couple quotations. First one is quotation number three from Councils to Writers and Editors, page 68. It says, our work is to do what? To prepare a people to do what? To stand in the day of the Lord. And we're going to talk more about this day of the Lord here in a bit. This is referring to like when Jesus is coming, right? Like at the very end. And this kind of ties in with that question at the end of uh, Revelation chapter 6. You know, the great, when the people are calling for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and hide them. And then the question is asked, you know, the great day of his wrath is coming. Who is able to stand? Well, God wants a people standing there. You know, when Jesus comes, he wants to come for somebody. He wants some people living Standing there, waiting for him, ready. People that have made it all the way to the end of the path. And this quote says, that's our work, to prepare a people to stand in the day of the Lord. Let's look at the next quote. Same idea, just a little different slant to it. 
Southern Watchman, March 21, 1905, says, In this age, just prior to the second coming of Christ in the cloud of heaven, God calls for men and women who will prepare a people to stand in the day of the Lord, in the great day of the Lord. Okay, so God wants people, it's our work to prepare people, and God's calling. Okay, who's going to help with this? Again, are we just content to get people started up the path or just help them along a little bit along the way? Now, I understand there's some people that you just come in contact with for a short time, and that's basically all you can do. And so I'm talking more about long-term, you know, those who God is having you minister to in a long, long, more long-term basis. What's your goal for them? Okay, let's go all the way to the end of the path. The trouble is, we tend to be like the Jews in Christ's time. I know there's quotations that kind of allude to that being the case. But what was their problem? Their, one, of them, one of their big problems is they were interpreting the prophecies. They were skipping to the good part. I'm going to call it that, skipping to the good part. Okay, they, wanted the, they, they were applying the prophecies of the second coming when Christ comes at a conquering king. They were applying those prophecies to his first coming. And they were looking for a Messiah that would come and kick out the Romans and set up his earthly kingdom. Okay, they skipped to the good part. And they missed out on all this other prophecies that dealt with Christ's first coming. And how the Messiah was going to come and suffer and die. And we tend to do that same thing in our own way. Okay, we want to skip to the good part. We talk about the second coming a lot. I mean, we're seventh day Adventists, right? That word Adventist means those who believe in the second coming of Christ. But we don't want to talk about all that's going to happen between now and then. Talked a little bit about that last night. Okay, there's a bunch of stuff that's going to happen between now and then. You know, if we're just preparing ourselves for what happens at the end of the path and we're not preparing ourselves to make it all the way down the path, we might miss out. And so this morning we're going to study like what's going to be on what's going to happen between now and the second coming rather than just skipping to the good part. There's a lot that's going to happen. Just like going up this path, there were several changes that had to happen along the way. That's kind of where we're going to conclude about talking about changes. And there's people that don't like change in their life, but there's life changing, several of them, several life changing changes that are going to happen between now and the second coming. And are we going to get blown away by those or are we going to be prepared for them? <clears throat> Again, I want you all to make it all the way to the end of the path, even though I'm here just for a weekend. A uh, key verse for our ministry is Proverbs 22, verse 3. And I'm going to teach you the Jim Buller mixed match version of it. So, I mean, you can look it up if you want to. That's fine. Uh, what I mean by the mixed match version is every phrase... Um, in what I'm going to teach you comes from one version or another. I've just worded it this particular way uh, for a reason that I uh, probably won't get around to sharing with you until Monday. Um, <clears throat> but that's okay. It goes like this. Wise people foresee trouble coming and avoid it, but foolish people keep going and suffer. Okay, let me say that one more time, then I want you to repeat it with me. Wise people foresee trouble coming and avoid it, but foolish people keep going and suffer. Proverbs 22, verse 3, yes. Uh, okay, say it with me now. Wise people foresee trouble coming and avoid it, but foolish people keep going and suffer. Okay, do you see how that fits in with that story? 
Okay, there were those who prepared themselves to go all the way to the end of the path. And there were others who just, well, this is a nice thing to do. Let's start out on the journey. But when one of these changes came along, they weren't prepared for that change and they ended up staying back. And they didn't make it to the end of the path. By the way, in the dream at the end, they end up swinging across on this cord, which has increased in size as they were walking up the path, swinging across the abyss, because the path just narrows out and quits. And there's this field of green grass on the other side representing heaven. So God wants us to know what's on the path ahead. The trouble is in our human ability, you know, wise people foresee trouble. We're only, we're very limited in what we can foresee. Okay, let's say a group of us are at the park, we're sitting around on the grass and we're watching somebody else playing with the ball and somebody kicks the ball and it's coming. And because of where we're seated, we can tell that, that ball's gonna land right here in our group and maybe hit somebody. Okay, you know, we can foresee that kind of stuff. We see something in motion, we can kind of guess at the trajectory and come pretty close a lot of times. It's what's going to happen. But long term, we can't foresee the future. But who can? God can, uh huh. In fact, in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, also uh, in chapter 20, uh, 45, there's some more, uh, several verses there in that whole area where God is basically throwing out a challenge and saying, hey, if anybody else can foretell the future, let them step up because I'm really the only one that can do this. And fortunately, God is a loving God, doesn't just keep this knowledge to himself. The old Adventist memory verse from way back, Amos 3, verse 7, says, surely the Lord God will do nothing except he does what? Reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. So if we're going to be wise and, see, you know, see what's coming, what do we need to do? We need to study the prophecies. Unfortunately, Adventists have kind of let that ball drop. I remember talking to people when I was much younger. It's like, oh, no, we don't talk about the prophecies. They're too scary. Or other such comments. You know, Adventism has been a prophetic movement all along. It was born out of prophecy. It's been carried along by prophecy. It's going to end in the fulfillment of prophecy. You know, let's not neglect to study of the prophecies. No, not going to... The picture they paint isn't something that's, you know, we're looking forward to. But that's no reason to neglect them. Talked about that last night. Uh, let's look at the next quotation. This is going to be the theme for the first part of our study this morning. Quotation number five from This Day with God, page 152. Where is she aiming us to? Twenty-fourth chapter of Matthew, and what do we find there? An outline of what is to come upon the world. So let's turn to Matthew chapter twenty-four, and we're going to go through the prophetic sequence part of this chapter and find this outline. Take a look at it, see what we can learn. Okay, look at verses 1 and 2. We're in Matthew 24. I'm going to be here for the next bit. So turn to Matthew 24. Keep it open there. And right now, uh, let's just look at the first couple verses. Okay, what's happening in the first couple verses? Where are they? Not yet. That's verse 3. We're just doing verses 1 and 2 right now. Okay, they're leaving the temple. And who's there? 
Jesus and his disciples. Yeah. Okay, so Jesus and his disciples are leaving the temple. And as they're leaving the temple, what does one of the disciples say? Yeah, look at the beautiful buildings. Okay, just think about that question or that comment for a minute. Yeah, that's a very patriotic Jewish thing to do. Okay, this is the only temple to Jehovah God in the whole world, and it's in their capital city, and they're right proud of that. To and on at the temple is a very patriotic Jewish thing to do. And so here, you know, they're leaving the temple, and one of the disciples is like, look at the magnificent buildings. But what does Jesus say? It's all coming down. Okay, it's probably not what they expected him to say. You know, it doesn't go with the flow of the patriotic Jewish comment to ooh and ah at the temple. It's all coming down. It's like, so what? You see it. It's all going to be destroyed. Okay, verse 3. Where are they? On the Mount of Olives. Okay, have any of you been over there? I've never been over there, but I've looked at maps and stuff. And uh, Jerusalem's on a mountain. You know, maybe not western U.S., type mountain, but still they call it the mountain, Mount Zion, Temple Mount, all of that. Okay, Jerusalem's on this mountain. And then there's the Kidron Valley and then the Mount of Olives. And they're about a little over half a mile, kilometer, about a kilometer apart. Not that far. Mount of Olives figures into several of the stories in the Gospels here because that's where Jesus and his disciples camped out when they were in the Jerusalem area. From the top of the Mount of Olives, it's a little bit taller than Jerusalem. You can look down and see the whole city. And the temple compound would have been a big part of that view. And so picture Jesus and the disciples are hanging out in their camp on the top of Mount of Olives, able to look down over the top of Jerusalem. Now the disciples are probably thinking about what Jesus said this whole trip. But they get over to camp, they're hanging out, and they're like, now's our chance to ask him. And so they ask him a couple questions about what he said. What are those questions? Okay, when will these things happen? Referring to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And... Okay, don't look down at your Bibles right now. Is that sign or signs? Is it singular or plural? Okay, look at your Bibles. What is it, singular or plural? Singular. singular. Okay, as Adventists, we talk about the signs, plural, of the time so much we tend to make this plural, but it's not, it's singular. Okay, they asked two questions now. Ellen White points out they think they're just asking one question because they figure, well, at the end of the world, everything's going to get destroyed, so of course the temple would be destroyed at that point. But Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed back in AD 70, and Jesus hasn't come yet. And so what we have here and what Jesus gives as we're going to read on is what we call a parallel prophecy. Ellen White uses the word twofold. It's twofold in its meaning. And I believe you have the quote there. Now, that's fortunate for us because we can look back and see what happened in connection with the destruction of Jerusalem time and get a much better idea of what's going to happen for us in the end times. And just keep in mind, this is a parallel prophecy. We're going to talk about these parallels from time to time as we go through this. But notice that second question in particular, okay? What will be the sign, singular, of your coming and the end of the world? Okay, would you like to have a sign that the final end time events are going to happen and Jesus is about to come? Yeah, okay, that's what they asked for. Now earlier Jesus had told them, you know, ask and you will receive. 
And so he's going to give them the sign that they asked for. And we're going to find it as we go through this study this morning. Before we start looking more specifically, though, let's take just a minute and think about in order for something to be a sign, what does it have to be? And right now I'm talking about any kind of sign, not necessarily a prophetic sign. In order for something to be a sign, any kind of sign again, what does it have to be? It has to be visible. It's got to be something that you can see. If you can't see it, so what? It might happen and be done and gone before you realize anything. That's not really a sign for you. Okay, so number one, it has to be visible. Number two, what else does it have to be? Once you see it, what, do you, what else has to happen? You have to recognize it. I'm going to use the word understand it. It has to be understandable. Okay, so in order for a sign to be a sign, again, I'm talking about any kind of sign right now. It has to be visible and it has to be understandable. And frequently signs are put up to get us to take some kind of action. For example, you're driving down the freeway and you're watching for your exit, right? And so then you see the sign that's letting you know it's time to turn off. Okay, visible, understandable action. Billboards. Buy this. Okay, they want you to see it, understand it, and desire it. They want you to go buy it. And so on. So, as we're reading through this prophetic sequence part of the chapter, which goes to verse 31, by the way, uh, we're going to be looking for that sign. Jesus starts talking in verse 4. But what's the first thing he says? You know, here, picture the disciples. They're like, tell us about end time events. And Jesus says, yeah, I'm going to tell you, but this is what you really need to be watching out for. What's he say in verse 4? And Five continues the same theme there. Yeah, take heed that you're not deceived. Okay, Jesus wants us to know what's going to happen. He's going to answer the disciples' question. It's important that we know what's going to happen so we can know on what's on the path ahead of us so we can prepare ourselves for these changes that need to be made. But Jesus' real concern is take heed that you're not deceived. And James tells us it's possible for us to deceive ourselves. So we even need to watch out for that. Let me give you a couple examples. I kind of overlooked this for a while, but this concern that Jesus has with his people being deceived is a theme throughout this whole discourse. Uh, we call it the Olivet Discourse sometimes, which is both Matthew 24 and 25. Uh, flip over to verse 37. Who's verse 37 talking about? Noah. Were the people in Noah's day deceived? Yeah. What was their deception? Okay, actually we have a global population there, so there's lots of possibilities. Uh, several different possible deceptions that they could have had. Uh, but what I find interesting is all of those deceptions, whatever they may have been. You know, Satan's got something for everybody. Whatever those deceptions may have been, there's one thing that all those deceptions had in common. And that was when the time came to get on the ark, none of them felt that it was important to do so. And I just like to throw out the idea, is it possible that there's something very important that we do that we're being deceived into thinking that it's not important to do. And this lets you think about that a bit. We'll address that later, but maybe not directly. Let me give you another illustration. Look at chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. It's the parable of the ten virgins. Probably most of you are familiar with this. So I'm just going to ask the question, were the foolish virgins deceived? Yeah, what was their deception? They thought they had enough oil. They thought they had what they needed to make it into the kingdom. But they really didn't. Let's be careful we're not deceived that way too. What I really want to say about this though is this 
discourse, this all of it discourse that Jesus gave with, to his disciples up there in the Mount of Olives that day, it ends with four major parables. First one starts on page, on verse 45 of Matthew 24, uh, which is the faithful or unfaithful servant. Second one's the parable of the ten virgins there in Matthew 25. And then in the middle of Matthew 25 is the parable of the talents. And then Matthew 25 ends with the parable of the sheep and the goats. And I used to look at these parables individually, and there's a lot that we can learn looking at them that way. But one day I just felt impressed, hey, look at them all together. You know, they have an awful lot in common. Okay, in each of these parables, there's a master or bridegroom who has gone away and comes back. <clears throat> in each of these parables, there's two groups of servants. Talked about the two groups last night. Two groups of people that consider themselves servants of the master or bridegroom. And at the end of the story, one of these groups is praised and rewarded and enters the kingdom. However, that's represented in the parable. The other group is rejected and cast out. Okay, both groups thought they were servants. Both groups thought they were going to get in. But one group was deceived. They didn't make it. And so Jesus is really concerned about, doesn't want us people deceived. And what I've in just, I would challenge you to study these parables. Because at the beginning of the discourse, Jesus says, watch out that you're not deceived. At the end of the discourse, he gives us these four parables, which I believe in these parables, he's giving us tools that we can look and make sure we're not deceived. You know, he wouldn't say, watch out that you're not deceived and kind of let it go at that. You know, he would want to explain that. If he really doesn't want us to be deceived, he's going to give us something we can use to discern whether or not we're being deceived. And because these parables are about groups of servants, that's for the church. Let's me know that there's going to be deceptions that are going to be common in the church in the end times that many people are going to be lost because they've been deceived by them. And he doesn't want us to be deceived by them. Now, that's a whole series of studies on its own, like I said earlier. You know, this is a study of studies, and any point we make here could be a whole another study or even a series of studies. This is a good example of that. So I just want to challenge you to study these parables on your own. Be sure you're not, one of, you're not deceived. One more illustration of how this is... This is um, being, his people being deceived is a theme throughout this discourse. Uh, we just read verse 4 and verse 5 goes right along with it. This is the first of three warnings about false Christs, false prophets, and deception that we're going to find as we read through this prophecy this morning. Uh, the other two, we'll just point them out when we get there. But uh, please study these also to be sure you're not deceived. That's particularly the third one. Okay, so we're back to looking for the sign. And that brings us to verses 6, 7, and 8. What do we have there? Let's make a list. Okay, wars. Rumors of wars. I'm going to throw that in with wars right now. What else? Pestilence. What else? Famines. What else? Earthquakes. Okay, wars, famines, pestilence, and earthquakes. Are these a sign? They're warnings. Are they the sign? How do we know they're not the sign? Exactly, yeah. The last part of verse 6 uh, says, These things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And then verse 8 says so these are the beginning of what? Sorrows. We're going to, before we're done today, we're going to study these three verses here because, um, again, uh, just about any point we make here could be a study in itself, and this one definitely needs to be addressed. Uh, so we're going to take, you know, our closing study for today, uh, this afternoon at 4 o'clock, I believe, is uh, we're going to address these. So I'm going to just, move on for right now 
um, with the promise that we'll come back and talk about them more because we definitely need to do that. Okay, verses 9 and 10. What do we have there? Persecution. Uh-huh, persecution. Our persecution the sign? No. You know, there's always been persecutions. And I think Jesus is, and just the way it's worded here, it's not worded as it's going to be a signal event. So, um, it's just letting us know that there's going to be persecutions in the end. Expect it brings us down to verse 11, which is the second warning about false Christ, false prophets, and deception. And that brings us to verses 12 and 13. What do we have there? Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Okay, I used to read these verses and think, well, as we get closer to the end, people are going to become less and less loving. And I do believe that's going to be happening. However, let's think about 1 John 4, 7 and 8, right? Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God. And knows God. So who this is talking about people whose love grows cold. Who is this talking to? Those who've had a relationship with God, the church. This is a warning to us. Okay, don't let your love grow cold. Because there's going to be stuff happening to try to make, to get you to let go. We need to be very deliberate and intentional about our relationship with God. You know, I just like to throw out the idea, is it possible that just being busy is one of the main evils of the end times? Okay, if just being busy causes you to let go of your relationship with God, is it going to be any worse, you know, in the end? Is it going to be any worse than some of these other big things that we talk about? So again, be very deliberate and intentional about your relationship with God. And in verse 13, we have the same idea echoed in that dream that we talked about at the beginning. He that endures to the end will be saved, not just those who start up the path. Okay, those who make it to the end, those are the ones who are going to be saved. So prepare yourself for the changes along the way. Brings us to verse 14. What do we have there? The gospel to the whole world. Is this the sign? Okay, I'm hearing yes and no. May just shorten things up here. Would the gospel to the whole world be something that would be visible and understandable to us? No. Okay, God can read hearts, so he'll know. Okay, but it would not be either visible or understandable to us. Okay, as somebody put it once, we don't have any way of verifying when it's happened, and therefore it cannot be assigned to us. Now, don't misunderstand me here. This is a very important verse. Let's us know what our job in the end time is. And so I'm not trying to downplay the importance of this verse at all. I'm just saying it cannot be the sign because it would not be either visible or understandable to us. So we need to keep looking. Which brings us to verses 15 and 16. They're all the same sentence. What do we have there? says, therefore, when you see. So this is something that's visible. A little later it says, be sure you understand. So this is something that's understandable. Now, it may seem like cryptic language, and for a long time I just skipped over it. Because I didn't understand what that was. 
But uh, that phrase, be sure you understand this, kept you know, ringing in my ears and in my heart. And I figured, oh, well, I, I've got to study this out because I need to understand it. Jesus says we need to understand this. And by the way, it's, they put that, you know, let the reader understand. It's put in parentheses in most translations. But Ellen White says that Jesus said that. It's not something the Bible writer added later. Those of you who have red letter editions, sometimes those, those words are not in red. But Jesus said that. Be sure you understand this. And so I had to study it out. And actually this study grew out of that. And in verse 16, when you see the abomination of desolation, what do you do? Yeah, that's a signal to flee. So quite possibly here we have the sign, something that's visible, something that can be understood. We may not understand it now. And here's an action to take. And what I'm going to say right now is that if this is the sign... Okay, the rest of the passage should bear it out. And so we're going to read on for now. I promise we will come back and talk about what the abomination of desolation is because we need to understand that. So for right now, let's read on. Verses 17, 18, 19, and 20. How could we summarize those verses? Okay, I'm hearing good stuff. I'm wanting to summarize all of those verses. They are all instructions for when we flee. Okay? I mean, we're, most of us were trying to be a little more specific with that, but I'm just keeping it general. They're instructions for when we flee. And then verse 21 says, For then. When is the then that verse 21 is talking about? Okay, I want you to, to see the flow of these verses here. Okay, starting with verse 15. It says, when you see the abomination of desolation, flee to the mountains. And here's some instructions about when we flee. For then, here's just like the why to flee. For then, what's going to happen? Great tribulation. Or to use the wording in Daniel 12, verse 1, that Jesus referred us to, among other places in Daniel, call it the great time of trouble. So if nothing else, the abomination of desolation marks the beginning of the great time of trouble. Verse 22, lest those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect safe, those days will be shortened. Verse 23 through 28 is the third warning <clears throat> about false Christ, false prophets, and deception. Verse 29, what do we have there? Let's make a list here again. We're going to come back to this later. What do we have listed in verse 29? Okay, the sun's going to be darkened. What else? The moon's not going to give its light. What else? Stars are going to fall. One more. Uh-huh, powers of heaven to be shaken. Okay, remember that list. We're going to come back to that. I'm going to call all of that just a cosmic event for right now. Okay, it's some cosmic happenings. And then verse 30 and 31. What are verse 30 and 31 talking about? Yeah, Jesus is coming. Okay, let's put all this on a timeline. Don't fill out your 
your timelines on your packet yet. Yeah, in your, in your uh, packet of uh, study guide and quote sheet there, there's a timeline. Please don't fill that out yet. Wait till we get done, because um, what we've found, if people start filling them out now, then they get stuff in the wrong places. Okay, so here we have the time of trouble. What event marks the beginning of the time of trouble? And at the abomination of desolation, we are supposed to flee. And we'll come back and talk about that some more. There is also these uh, disasters, like the wars, famines, diseases, and earthquakes. Happening. And then what event marks the end of the time of trouble? Uh-huh, this cosmic event. Or cosmic happenings, I guess we could call it. And then what happens? Yeah, then Jesus comes. Just, uh, I don't know, feel I need to say this. A lot of our people have joined these two events. They're really two different events. And it wasn't until I realized that they were actually two different events till a lot of these pieces started falling into place. So just wherever that's worth. Um, have to ask the question, because I'm in an Adventist church here. Where are we on this timeline? Are we here? Or are we here? You understand why I'm asking that question? Okay, interesting thing is the Millerites back in the early 1800s, studied this same prophecy and came to the same conclusions that we've come to. And they saw fulfillment of these cosmic events in things that happened in the late 1700s and early 1800s. And they saw fulfillment of all of this in connection with the 1,260 day prophecy in Daniel And what's the very next thing in the prophecy? So they figured they were here in time. What's the next thing in this prophecy? Jesus comes. And that gave emphasis to their belief that Jesus was coming in 1844. However, shortly after the passing of the time, okay, when Jesus didn't come, young girl named Ellen White, or Ellen Harmon at that time, started receiving visions. And I think I gave you the quote here. One of the early things that God showed her, yeah, quotation number eight. It's on early writings, okay. The early things that she wrote. Page 36, that's fairly early on in the book. God told her that the time of trouble, such as never was, has not yet commenced. So at one point they thought we were here and I've had Adventists tell me, oh yeah, this has happened already, so we're here. And that's true. But the quote says, this hasn't started yet, which puts us back here. 
So that tells us something real interesting. I'll get your question just a minute there. Tells me there's actually three parallels to this prophecy. Remember, we saw two already with the destruction of Jerusalem and the end times, and the Millerites discovered a third one, which is what happened in connection with the 1,260 day prophecy of Daniel 7. Question. Yes, uh, we're going to be filling this in before we're done this morning. Um, and maybe we'll talk about that, or, or I think you will see what, I don't like the term little time of trouble. I think it's, a, it's not scriptural. And too many of our people think, oh, it's just gonna be a little time of trouble. I can deal with that. And they don't prepare themselves for it when it's actually gonna be a pretty big deal. Okay, so there's actually three parallels to this, and we are not here, so I'll erase this. We're actually back here. And if you can't see this chart, we're gonna be working with this chart um, from now to the end of the study might want to sit up a little closer. I wish we had a larger board, but this is what we have to work with. So it's on the screen. It's on the screen. Awesome. Does that work for the old you in the back? Yeah. Good. Good. Thank you very much to the camera people that set that up. Um, this is a good time to take a break. I'm glad we got this far. So um, we will close for now and we'll pick this up again during the church worship study time. And so I'll turn it back over to you, Tom. You want to use this one? Let's end with a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the Sabbath school session that we've had up until now. Help us keep in memory the key elements that we studied today. We thank you for your word, your guidance through the end times. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Amen. Just a quick reminder, the study guide that you have in your hand, we're going to be using this for the main service too, so don't get rid of this one. We have a 10-minute break right now at 1030. We'll be coming back in the sanctuary at 1040 for our main service, so if you need to... Um, Stretch a little bit, get some fresh air, go to the bathroom, get some, drink some water. Go ahead and do that now. We'll see you in just a few minutes. Blessings.